All right. Um, just going to go into the message right now, and I'm glad that uh, Lance prayed that uh, the blessing upon the message, so we're good to go. Um, that's what we need. Uh, the message is called High Calling, Low Lifestyle, and uh, it's based on Ephesians 4, 1 to 6. So let's, uh, let's read that now, if we could. As a prisoner for the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Now make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all, and in all. I think one of the uh, biggest challenges in the Christian church is to maintain a spirit of unity. Uh, there's always been, uh, you know, there, there are always issues of division and hard feelings. Even in the early church, you can read through the book of Acts and see the divisions and, and all, just all the letters from the apostles in the New Testament. And if you've been a part of a church for any length of time, this is not a newsflash, is it? You know various uh, problems causing hard feelings continue to come up time after time. And I've spent most of my time in Baptist circles, that's okay, I hope. But we used to joke, um, sort of joke, that the most effective way is that we have found to plant new churches is through church splits. And fortunately, there is some truth to that. Now, I realize that sometimes it is appropriate to stand, to take a stand uh, up to maybe obvious situations of abuse or lack of integrity in a church setting. We need, uh, need to always stand up with what's right. And if the situation is toxic enough, you know, it may even require a move to a different church. That's just the way it is sometimes, unfortunately. But still, the overall goal of every legitimate church is to have a spirit of unity and peace in Christ. Unity is worth fighting for. Jesus knew uh, a spirit of unity was always going to be a huge challenge for the church to down through the ages. And so the night before his crucifixion, he spent a lot of time praying to God as recorded in John chapter 17. And one of the major themes was the prayer for the church, was prayer for the church unity after he had left planet earth. And he says this, my prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. That would be us, right? That all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. That's pretty much one, one place of oneness, isn't it? He goes on to say, I've given them, listen to this, I have given them the glory that you gave me. What does that mean? The glory that God gave to Jesus. Jesus says, I've given them the same glory. I'm not sure, but it sounds incredible. Why did he, why did we receive the same glory? That they, meaning us, may be one as we are one. I in them, you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Wow, that's a challenge, isn't it? A huge challenge for the church. So, our scripture uh, reading this morning in Ephesians chapter 4, um, uh, I believe the Apostle Paul is, uh, is trying to tell us, or going to start telling us, his answer to church unity. And uh, just so you're aware, uh, well, the last uh, uh, four verses are filled with uh, different descriptions of unity, as you may have noticed, you know, make every effort to keep the unity, uh, one body, one spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God. It was like four verses worth of the unity <laughs> that, 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 that Paul was bringing out. But the first two verses, that's fine and dandy to say that we should be this way, but how can we? The first two verses tell us how it all comes about, as far as I can see, anyhow. You can let me know whether you think it's true or not after my sermon. But Paul tells, as far as I can see, Paul tells us two things we need to do in order to experience unity from verses 1 and 2. First of all, we need to receive our high calling. 
We have a high calling that requires a lifestyle that is worthy of it. Verse 1, as a prisoner of the for the Lord, I urge you to live a life worthy of a calling you have received. What does that mean? Well, um, if we uh, were privileged to be born into a royal family, and get caught up in the, this court here, if we were privileged to be born into a royal family, which I'd assume none of you have, there are certain expectations that come with that, right? Uh, we would be in an honored position, and in order to maintain the trust of the people, we would need to live a life of integrity that is worthy of such a high calling. And of course, there's a picture of Queen Elizabeth up there. She just died recently, right? And uh, she was a huge, uh, I forget how long, how long did she reign anyhow? 70 years? Wow. Anyhow, um, she's a good example of that, right? I mean, she was highly respected across the world for decades. I would say she is worthy of that high calling. She was worthy of it. So Paul is telling us that if we are a Christian, we need to first realize that we have a high calling. Believe me, it is a very high calling. And because of that, we need to be worthy of that calling in the way we live. Now, uh, second point here, under that calling, high calling, we have a high calling because God Almighty has called us to it. God Almighty has called us to it. One of the deepest truths of our faith is a realization that initially, from our own initiative, no human being chooses to become a follower of Jesus. Not, not in our uh, primary initiative. Because Jesus said this in John 15, 16, You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you. If we have been seeking Jesus, and some, most of us here have, of course, is only because Jesus has put that desire into our hearts in the first place. He reached out to us first. And it is only God who has enabled us to come to Jesus. John 6, 44. Jesus said, no man, no one, sorry, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. Isn't that interesting? We have a high calling because it is a calling from God Almighty himself. It is everyone's responsibility to either receive it or not receive it. And there's, of course, different levels in which we can do that. A, th a third point here, under this high calling, we have a high calling in spite of our natural inability to fulfill it. You might say, now, why would Jesus call me? I'm nothing special. I haven't got too much to contribute. I've got a, lot of hang, I've got a lot of hang ups in my life. Do, do, do some of you have a lot of hang ups in your life? I do. I would not be a good advertisement for Christianity. <laughs> well, maybe so. But we need to realize this. When Jesus was on earth, he didn't choose winners for the most part, he tended to choose those who struggled in life. The 12 disciples, did you know he prayed all night before he chose the 12 disciples? The 12 disciples were emotionally immature, all of them. And they were all constantly arguing through the three and a half years they were with Jesus, you know, day and night. They were all constantly arguing as to who was the greatest. Now, I call that immaturity. Can you imagine? No, I'm the greatest. No, I'm the greatest. No, I'm the greatest. We might think it, but we never say it, you know. And that's what it was. That's what it was. And even on the night before he was crucified, they were still arguing who was the greatest at the Lord's table. Can you imagine? Can you even imagine? But these are the ones that Joe's, Jesus chose uh, for his ministry. Did I? He says in John 6, 70, Did I not choose you, the twelve? Wow. Paul says this in 1 Corinthians. Uh, uh, he says this in 1 Corinthians 1. For consider your calling, brothers, uh, not many of you were wise according to the worldly standards, right? Uh, not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, 
even things, uh, e e even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. Wow, God's heart is drawn towards the underdogs, not the top dogs or the hot dogs. <laughs> Well, sometimes I've been called the hot dog, but that's okay. I kind of actually relish it. All right. <laughs> One person got it. Anyhow, our calling, <laughs> number D, it's that next point on our calling. Our calling is so high that God himself became a human being to die to make us pure. Do you believe that? Now, can you imagine that? God Almighty, here we are, a bunch of rebels and hung up with all sorts of problems. Immature. And yet God says, I love you so much. I want you so much. I'm going to become a human being. I'm going to go on the cross. I'm going to take your sins and all your problems and all your hangups upon myself. And then I'm going to pay the price for them so that I can forgive you and embrace you just the way you are. Do you find that amazing? I find it amazing. It's called the gospel. So, but how can an impure human being serve a pure God? This is what we have. We needed to be forgiven and cleansed. God wants us so much that he became a human being to die for our sins in order to make us pure. God's plan from the beginning has always been to clean us up and make us pure. The entire first three chapters of Ephesians describes our high calling. That's what he's saying. In view of your high calling, this is how you should live. The first three chapters of Ephesians, you want to read through it this afternoon or something, go for it. Incredible stuff. And uh, anyhow, this, that is the context for the high calling we have received. So let's take a look at this, Ephesians 1, 7 to 8. In him, in Christ, we have redemption. That means he's, he's, he's uh, bought us from slavery and freed us through his blood. The forgiveness of trespasses according to the riches of his grace. You know, God is so holy and we're so unholy. There's a huge, infinite gap between the two. So when he says, you're forgiven, that's got to be... Uh, rich, richly, rich grace, when you say that's rich grace, that he lavished upon us. Did you say, well, I'll give you a little bit of grace. No, he says, here's, here's tons of grace. I'll give you more and more and more and more, more than you need. I lavish it on you. Is God like that? In all wisdom and insight. In other words, God, do you know what you're doing? Angels might say to God, do you know what you're doing? Give him that much grace. No, I know what I'm doing. I've got, I know what I'm doing. And then we read in Ephesians 1, 4, even as he chose us in Christ, he chose us in Christ, when? Before the foundation of the world. I don't understand that. That we should be holy and blameless before him. That's the way God sees us through Christ. When there's not enough evidence to convict a guilty person on trial, he is declared not guilty, right? You go, you, you go before the court, you go before the judge, and you, you've committed a crime, you're guilty of sin. <laughs> Nonetheless, there's not enough evidence to convict you, so you are declared not guilty. Right? And then you're once again released in society and free from con condemnation, even though you still really are guilty, in a sense. And it's kind of the same with us, because God could not find any evidence to convict us. What? You know why? Because Jesus took all our sin upon himself on the cross, when he was, and when he was buried... He took all that evidence with him. And when we put our faith in Jesus, that becomes a reality for us. That's why God, the judge, justifies us and declares us as holy so that we can be close to him at any time. We are so pure before God, we can now boldly approach God without fear. You know that, don't you? Ephesians 2.18, again, just a little bit earlier in this, in this chapter, in this book. For through him, through Christ, we both, talking about Jews and Gentiles, have access in one spirit to the Father. We can march right into his presence. Now you have a picture there, I think, of a high priest in the, in the, in the Holy of Holies on the Day of Atonement. Even the high priest in Israel could only come into the presence of God in the most holy place once a year on the Day of Atonement with the blood of an animal sacrifice. If he had come into God's presence at any other time or at any other way, he would have been struck dead. That's how holy God is. Yet, we can come to God anytime we please by the blood of Jesus. We have such 
a high calling. And not only do we come into God's presence at any time, this next point here, we have a high calling because God has chosen to live inside of us. Well, this is hard to believe, but anyhow, here it is, Ephesians 3, 16 to 17, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being. That's the Holy Spirit he's talking about. His spirit. So that Christ may dwell or live in your hearts through faith. Do you believe when you became a Christian, you were born again, that the Holy Spirit came in and united with our spirit? And the Holy Spirit, do you believe the Holy Spirit is God? He's in there. And do you believe Christ is God? <laughs> that Christ may dwell in your hearts. The Holy Spirit brought both the life of the Father and the Son into our hearts when he came in. No wonder we are told in 1 Corinthians 6, 19, or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own. Our bodies, you know, it used to be God used to be in a physical temple, right? Holy of Holies. Now, he says, I'm going to go, if you accept me through Jesus, I'm going to come and live inside of your hearts. And you're going to be a temple, one of my moving temples from the inside out. Isn't that amazing? I, I find that amazing. God has chosen to live inside of us. And you know why? It's not only to empower us, he does, he gives us the power of his life. We can start living for him, like Jesus began, once we live by faith. But it, he also gives us his life so that we can become his children. That's what we're told in Romans. Here's a couple of things here. I just think it's amazing stuff. The spirit, he said, Paul says in, in Romans 8, the spirit you received does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. Yikes. And by him we cry, Daddy, Abba means Daddy, Daddy, Father. When his life comes into us. The Spirit himself, the Holy Spirit, testifies with our spirit, joins with our spirit, that we are God's children. Because we are uh, ch uh, children, or we are heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, whatever Christ has inherited, we have inherited the same thing. Can there be any higher calling than that? Amazing. Here's uh, uh, the, next, uh, ver the rest of that verse in Romans 8. Um, I guess I just right there. Uh, now, if your children were heirs and, and heirs of God, co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in Christ's suffering, or that we may also share in Christ's glory. Heirs of God, co-heirs with Christ. Whatever Christ has inherited, we inherit with Him. What does that mean? I'm not sure what that means. Does anybody really know what it means? But it sounds pretty powerful to me. We share. In Christ's glory. Because we are God's children, we are heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. Whatever Jesus has inherited, we have inherited the same thing. Can there be any higher calling than that? What an unbelievably high calling. But you might be thinking, hey, if I really believe that kind of calling, I would become arrogant. But the amazing thing is this. The more we receive the great things God has done for us, the more humble we will be. It is because we have a high calling. It is because we have a high calling that we're able to live or have a low lifestyle. High calling, low lifestyle. So in order to experience unity in the church, we must first receive our high calling in order that we can have a low lifestyle. That's number two. That's the second thing we need to do. We need to enter into a low lifestyle. Ephesians 4, 1 and 2, I therefore, the prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love. You know what that means, eh? Bearing with one another in love. Sometimes we can be unbearable, right? And other people around us have to bear with us because we are unbearable. And we all are at one time or another, right? Because none of us is perfect. Eh? Maybe one or two of you, I don't know, but not me. Well, uh, this is from the ESV translation because it's closer to the original Greek. The, the, 
that uh, phrase up there. Uh, to walk, I mean, it says to walk. To walk in a certain way is the same thing as, as a kind of lifestyle that we have. And here Paul is urging us to live in a manner that is worthy of such a high calling we received. Verse 1 starts out with, therefore. Do you see that? I, therefore. Whenever you see therefore, always ask why it's therefore, right? In Ephesians 1 to 3, the first three chapters of Ephesians, he has been describing the unbelievable high calling we have received from God. Paul is not afraid that believing in such a high calling will make us proud and arrogant. Obviously, right? Just the opposite. He says, because God has made us so high with him, we can now be so low with each other. The Greek word for humility in this verse literally means low-mindedness. It is because we're so high that we're able to live so low. So here's my understanding about uh, pride, because it, you may might say, well, that, that, no, that still sounds like it's going to make somebody proud to believe all that stuff. Well, do you know what causes pride? This is my own understanding. If you don't agree with it, that's okay, but it's my own understanding as I read scripture. Do you know what causes pride? It's our inferiority complex, our inferiority complex. When Adam and Eve turned against God, the first thing that happened to them was shame, right? They're naked. Ah, cover up. They felt shame about their nakedness, and they covered themselves, and they hid in fear from God. They felt inadequate. Human beings have been striving for acceptance before God and from each other ever since. Deep down, we all feel, deep down, we all feel unacceptable and in fear. That's the natural human condition. I would say there's no exception for that as far as I can see. And so, we are constantly trying to prove how wonderful or how good we are to God and to each other. We are subconsciously calling out, please accept me. I'm trying to be significant. And that's what the Pharisees did. They were always bragging about how wonderful they were, right? They were trying, and before God and before other people, right? They were trying to earn acceptance from God and people because they felt so small. The amazing truth is this. The more we believe in our incredibly gracious high calling from God, the more we will feel secure. And the more we will be able to live in genuine, humble love towards each other. We don't have to try and impress anyone anymore. No, it's not necessary anymore. We are securing God's love. We love because God first loved us. That's in 1 John, I believe. I notice... Uh, uh, how Paul um, uh, does not threaten us or lay a guilt trip on us when he encourages us to live in humility and love towards each other. He says, I urge you. I urge you. That's verse 1. That's the, Gre uh, the Greek word for urge means to help, comfort, encourage, and invite. He's saying, I want to invite and encourage you to live this way. By this high calling, God has now made it possible. He's freed us from this desire to be, look impressive to people. By this high calling, high calling, God has now made it possible for us to live in humble love. Therefore, I urge you to please live that way. Humility, gentleness, patience, and love is the goal of Christian maturity. It is the goal of discipleship. That's what we're after. In my opinion, true discipleship is simply learning how we can become more like Jesus. And the more we receive our high calling, the more we will see the love and mercy and grace of God towards us. Isn't that right? The more you see this and say, I can't believe it. You know, raised with Christ, seated with him in heavenly places right now. What? God, how could you be so gracious to me? I'm such a loser. <laughs> And that does something to our hearts. It humbles us. It humbles us. It's like I can't believe that God would, would call me to be his child. And he'd elevate me to such an incredible height. I don't deserve this. What a wonderful, gracious, and loving God he is. Now that realization does not make us proud. It makes us humble. And it makes us humble towards others. 
Now, Jesus uh, was the image of God on earth, right? He, you see that in John. And if you see, Jesus said in John, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. I'm coming here to show you what God's like at the heart of his, at his heart, the core of his heart. And uh, he showed God to us. How would you describe Jesus and describe God otherwise? How would you describe Jesus? How about humble, gentle, patient, and loving? He was so patient with us and with his, dis uh, with his disciples, rather, and so gracious to tax collectors, thieves, and prostitutes. He loved the up-and-outers and the down-and-outers. Isn't that amazing? That describes Jesus. And I will say this. If we primarily believe that God or Jesus is harsh and demanding in, in, the, in the core of his being, even though it says God is love, it would be and will be impossible for us to be for us to be humble gentle patient and loving is only as we constantly absorb the life of Jesus that will be transformed and so our high calling automatically leads to lowly living which as we will see now results in unity here it is our unity we will have then have unity in the church. Here are the verses again. We read them at the beginning. Uh, verses 2 to 6 of Ephesians 4. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient. Bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. There's one body. One spirit. Just you recall the one hope. When you were called one Lord. One faith. One baptism. One God and Father of all. Who is over all. Through all. And in all. There it is again. Right? Wow. The key. To unity is a church full of people who are humble, gentle, patient, and who are therefore able to bear with one another in love. Would that, make, would that cause unity if we are all that way? Would that cause oneness? We are all difficult to love at times, let's face it. And the more we learn to live with low servant hearts towards each other, especially when we don't, don't deserve it, <laughs> the greater our unity will be. We will be patiently and graciously serving each other in love. And so, uh, I think that this uh, passage in Ephesians 4 that we have looked at this morning gives us a sequence of the best way to reach the goal of unity in the church. Here it is, just a review, basically. Gratefully receive our high calling from God. That's a, that's a hard one, but if we do, that results in, I can't believe you're so good to me, Lord, humble hearts of patient love. That's low lifestyle. High calling, low lifestyle. So a low lifestyle towards each other, which results in number three, unity in the church. High calling, low lifestyle, unity in the church. But the most important item in that sequence is the first one, I believe, because that's the source. To receive our high calling. Why? Because the Christian life, as far as I can see in the scriptures, is a cycle. And everything begins by receiving the grace of God. It doesn't begin with us. It begins with God. He's the initiator. He's the creator. Everything is from God by receiving. Everything we do is through God by releasing. God's living in me. Everything, every, we step out in faith. It's not like, what, what good deeds can I do? Well, God, what good deeds do you want to do through me? I'll step out in faith and, and maybe your life can, can, come, can go through me and, and touch that person. Isn't that wonderful? Everything we do is through God. And everything ultimately goes back to God by rejoicing. God, look what you did through me. Aren't you wonderful? I know this requires humility to talk like that, right? We're not patting ourselves on the back at this point in time. We're giving glory to God. Well, here it is, the final, uh, final statement here. That's why Paul summarized the gospel message of grace at the end of Romans 11 this way. Romans 11, 35 to 36 who has ever given to God that God should repay them? You know what he's saying? The answer to that question is nobody. Nobody's ever done, look, look, I've done, done this for you. I've done this for you for God. God said, wow, you've done all that. Now I'm obligated to bless you. <laughs> Who's ever given to God that God should repay them? Well, nobody. Why? Here's the reason. For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him. Be the glory forever. Amen. Romans 11. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that uh, 
You're the great initiator. You're the great lover. Love, you're the source of all true love. And, uh, you know, we have, uh, we have our own kind of human love, which is imperfect. <laughs> but you have a perfect, pure love to love sinners to the point of death. And that's the kind of love you've filled us with when we accept Jesus as our Savior. And Lord, if anyone here has never accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior and put their faith in Him for salvation, I pray that even right now you would grant a spirit of humility and faith that they would do that and surrender to you. What a life. What a God. We give you praise.